I now give the floor to Ms. Maud Barlow, National Chairper Chairperson of the Council of Canadians in Ottawa, Ontario. Ms. Barrow is a recipient of 12 honorary doctorates, as well as many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternate, Alternative Nobel Prize. She also served as Senior Advisor on Water to the President of the 63rd Session of the General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the United Nations. I now give the floor to Ms. Maud Barlow. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, distinguished members, for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. In our world, nature is seen as a form of property, a resource for our pleasure, convenience, and profit. The legal systems in most of our countries are not protecting the earth because they are not meant to. In fact, our legal and political establishments perpetuate, protect, and legitimize the continued degradation of the earth by design, not accident. Most laws to protect the environment and other species just regulate the amount of damage that can be inflicted by human activity. Harmony with Nature recognizes that our current form of industrial development is doing untold harm to the earth and calls for laws that allow other species to fulfill their evolutionary role on the planet. Harmony with Nature requires us to create human laws and governance systems that promote both human health and well-being and the well-being of the wider ecological community. Harmony with nature would have us develop laws and policies that put the protection of air, soil, water, wetlands, forests, and other species at the very center of all practices and policies and judge everything from the way we grow food and produce energy to global economic and trade policy by their impact on the natural world. The Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, which emerged from a 2010 civil society gathering after the failure of the Copenhagen 2009 session, uh, recognizes that Earth is in an indivisible living community of interrelated and interdependent beings with inherent rights. The Declaration defines fundamental human responsibilities in relation to other beings and to the community as a whole. The late esteemed Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano promoted Ecuador's groundbreaking rights of nature law. He said that since the days when the sword and the cross made their way into the Americas, Ecuador has suffered repeated devastation, including massive pollution of its Amazon forests by foreign oil corporations. Harmony with nature is a step toward recovering the ancient Latin American tradition of the adoration of nature, which was seen by Europeans as the sin of idolatry and punished by torture and death. In an anthology on the rights of nature, Galliano wrote, nature has a lot to say, and it has been a long time for us, her children, to stop playing deaf, maybe even God, will hear the cry rising from this Andean country and add an 11th Amendment, which he left out when he handed down the instructions on Mount Sinai. Love nature, which you are part of. Communities around the world are not waiting for governments. They are creating a new form of civil rights movements. They are passing local laws that assert their right to protect their local environment from harmful mining, fracking, pipeline, and other invasive practices. What we need to do is restructure the global economy into many local economies based on the respect for and the needs of the biosphere. When this happens, communities will become true stewards of their ecosystems, protecting and upholding these natural rights. Surely then, the rights of nature need to be placed at the center of the post-2015 SDGs, particularly SDG 12, 
on consumption and production. For instance, we know that the current system of chemical dependent, water intensive industrial food production for a global market is consuming over 80% of the world's fresh water. If nature's imperatives, if the notion of harmony with nature were placed at the center of the SDGs and other policies, the current system would have to be radically reformed and food production would have to be more local, sustainable, and organic. Corporate control of farming would have to be challenged. If nature's imperatives were placed at the center of the SDGs and other policies, mm -hmm. we would not move water around from the watershed with which, in which it was placed um, to where we want it. And this is the story that's happening all over the world. It's not drought in California. It's not drought in Sao Paulo. It is the destruction of the hydrologic cycle by the removal of, of water from water retentive landscapes. And it is my great hope that when we talk about climate change that we understand it's not just that greenhouse filled, greenhouse fueled climate change is impacting water in a negative way, which is true. But the way we are abusing, diverting, mining groundwater, displacing water from where it's needed is one of the causes of climate change. And one of the solutions to climate change is the restoration of water retentive landscapes and the deep uh, protection of, uh, of watersheds as a public sphere. As well for the post 2015 development agenda to reach its objective of being just, people centered and sustainable, the goals must enshrine for future and all present, uh, present and all future generations the human right to water for health, life, food, and culture over other demands on water resources, especially industrial consumption. The goal must be to pr pr promote a hierarchy of water use that prioritizes human needs, local consumptions, healthy ecosystems, and the needs and rights of other species setting a zero target on freshwater extraction beyond sustainable supply and protecting and restoring aquifers and watersheds. This is even more critical given the key role of water in achieving other development goal objectives such as sustainable energy, food production, gender equality, and climate change mitigation. Now, the United Nations has gone a long way in stating a commitment to these goals. I agree with my sister on the, uh, the, on the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and a tremendously important uh, commitment. In 2010, I had the honor of being part of the process to have the United Nations General Assembly recognize the human right to water and sanitation. And in my opinion, the human species took a, an evolutionary step forward on that day it didn't mean that the next day everything was all right, but it did mean that as a human species, we, saw, we decided that it wasn't all right for a child to die of waterborne disease because its parents didn't have money for water. And now we're into this next phase of our evolution. Since 2009, the General Assembly has adopted six resolutions on harmony with nature recognizing that planet Earth and its ecosystems are our home and that deleterious human activity is altering the dynamic functioning of the Earth system to a degree never seen before. The UN importantly recognizes that the Earth is not simply a source of resources to be exploited, modified, altered, privatized, commercialized, and transformed without huge consequences to humankind and the earth. The United Nations is also very positive that the General Assembly instructed that harmony with nature be incorporated into the post-2015 development agenda. However, and I want to place this warning very strongly here, there are conflicting values and goals here. There are some states and actors that are pushing for a much bigger role for the private sector within a global context in which there is no binding international agreement to hold corporations accountable for human rights violations and environmental destruction. As well, the economic globalization policies of most governments 
are totally contradictory to harmony with nature. These policies include unlimited economic growth, the deregulation of financial markets, the gutting of environmental regulations, which is happening in many countries around the world, mine in particular, Canada, and the proliferation of trade and investment agreements that give the market great power to set policy and now give corporations the right to sue governments of another country uh, if they bring in any kind of legislation or rules that would actually promote and protect nature and the natural world or human rights or human health. I had the um, opportunity last week to be on a panel with Chancellor Merkel, uh, who is in Germany, who is going to be hosting the G7 meeting uh, in June. Um, and while I said the goals of the G7, which are about empowering women and dealing with climate change and looking at the issues around inequality and so on, all of those are very admirable, as is the G7's supposed support for the SDGs, the macroeconomic policies that these countries and others are continuing to promote are going in the opposite direction. You cannot hand enormous power over to corporations, deregulate your financial and environmental rules, and then and give these companies the power to say never can you get them back, and hope to shift to the kind of worldview that we just heard um, so passionately articulated um, in the last two speakers. Simply put, we can have harmony with nature and a just system of sharing the Earth's bounty, or we can have market-driven economic globalization. But in my opinion, we cannot have both, and we're going to have to make some strong decisions. It is important to note that the only enforceable international agreements we have devised are trade and investment agreements that serve to empower transnational capital, commitment to environmental and human rights standards at an international level. They're very important, but they're non-binding. This imbalance between the power given to trade and investment agreements to promote private interests and the lack of similar power to promote the rights of nature, harmony with nature, the rights of our Earth, uh, has got to be addressed if we are to stop the plunder of our planet. Will the dominant vision for sustainability within the SDG process be one that seeks to bring environmental strategies in line with the economic growth imperative? Or will it be one that questions the impacts of economic growth on the environment? Those are two very different ways of looking at these development goals that we are preparing now much rides on the answer to this question. Unless it explicitly gives priority to people and the planet above corporations, mm -hmm. the SDG framework could reinforce and exacerbate existing patterns of human and environmental domination. As the SDG process prepares to set the foundation for international development over the next 15 years, it must decide whether development funds and strategies will promote human rights, alleviate poverty, and protect Mother Earth, or whether the development agenda will be used to open new markets in the name of the green economy and give even greater corporate access to endangered natural resources. The SDGs must recognize the universality of human rights and must recognize the universality of Mother Earth. Mother Earth is calling on us to do the right, to take the right path. And I would just end with the, the words of the great English Victorian poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, who talked about how nature can regenerate if we just allow it to. And he said, and for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. Let us give our mother a chance. Thank you.